My name is Steve Callum, and I am the director of the Clean Energy Technology Center over at NC State. Uh, we're a little different than some of the other centers at universities around the state, and then we're more on the extension and engagement side of the land grants. A lot of the work that we do is out in the field working directly with communities on different topics. We've been involved in the clean energy field since we were founded uh, a long time ago, all the way back in 1988, spinning out of the solar house that was built on campus all the way back in 1981. So uh, we've been at it. I'm not that old, although I'm maybe a little older than my book. Um, but I, I've been involved in, uh, predominantly in renewables and energy efficiency for a little over 25 years. And so when Joe just asked if I could come out and talk a little bit about energy transitions in rural communities, uh, I was excited about the opportunity because it's basically all I'm spending my time on these days, uh, although largely focused around solar. Now I'll just place my hands up here. So we have, we have a great panel today, and I'm just going to give a couple of opening prefacing comments. And I would say that you know, we were initially discouraged to use slides today, and so I didn't draw up any slides and muted in most of our panel. And then our previous panel then embarrassed us all. And so uh, we do have a few folks that have added some slides and had slides in their back pocket. I'm sure Mike actually probably doesn't leave his house without at least two slide decks in his pocket every day, uh, wherever he's going. Uh, I have a couple of PowerPoints, and uh, I'm not going to go through the uh, 427 slides in this deck real quick, but I am going to skip through a couple just to uh, highlight a couple of points that we've talked about. Uh, and it helps set the stage, uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to our panel. So, you know, in North Carolina, this idea of energy transitions in rural communities, you know, it really has been, uh, in a lot of ways, if you think about it, one of the few economic development policies for rural economic development that we've had in the state that has been effective in the last decade. Uh, in fact, we've, un we've undone more economic development policy around economic development in rural parts of the state. Uh, changes in places like uh, the rural center, uh, the biofuels center, uh, even some of the biotech center activities. We, we've reduced investment at the state level in some of these things, and we've seen uh, changes in the, in the same thing in the clean energy space. For example, we lost the state tax credit a few years ago. But in spite of the, some of those things, you know, renewable energy in particular uh, has been a significant uh, mover in North Carolina in terms of, of investments in rural communities. This is just a typical farm out in Davidson, North Carolina, 16 megawatts. And somebody did allude to the fact that somehow North Carolina, although no one knows it unless you're in this room or in one of about six other places, no one realized that North Carolina suddenly is the second largest solar market in the United States behind California. It happened very quickly. And, you know, it is very scattered. You see, if you look at this chart, and I, I credit the Sustainable Energy Association of North Carolina, which does a lot of great GIS work on this. But you can see the larger circles are the larger scale farms. You can see the tiny little dots around the metro areas, Asheville, Wilmington, the Triangle, the Triad, and the Charlotte area. Those are more residential scale systems. Uh, but a lot of these bigger circles are in rural parts of the state. Um, you know, and a lot of this got driven by a bunch of uh, policy that was put in place back uh, large, some of it you know, way back, federal policies. A lot of it uh, kind of really started to ramp up in 2007 with the, with the uh, North Carolina Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. Uh, but a lot of these policies are going away now, and we're not really seeing a loss in the, in the growth of renewables. And so this is maybe an area where public policy is doing what it's supposed to. We're actually seeing uh, policy create a market, and then as the market grows and becomes self-sustaining, we're getting rid of those policies uh, because we're not eating them as much anymore. Uh, and that has been interesting. This is one of my favorite charts. It just shows how fast this happened. So you can't see actually any of these dates on here, but all the way down here on one hand in the blue, blue, that's the 1911. That was the amount of renewable energy in North Carolina. It was hydropower. Uh, you can see the, the TVA jobs projects during the Great Depression starting to ramp up the hydropower. You can see the, the orangish color starting to come in as we start to see the pulp and paper and furniture industry starting to do some biomass in the 40s and 50s and uh, finding uses for waste products that could turn into energy. And not a lot happened until, uh, you know, to change that equation until uh, 2008, which was a year after we passed the portfolio standard. That's when the yellow starts to come in. And uh, you can see that from 2008 to 2017, which is the last year on that chart, the solar now is larger than all the rest of it combined. Uh, it just happened like that in North Carolina. Those two little green dots, that's the Amazon wind farm up in uh, Pasquotank, where we 
is the largest wind farm, actually the only really significant wind farm in the southeast. Uh, it, of course, led to a moratorium on wind development in North Carolina, uh, which will uh, perhaps, depending on what the next special session does, uh, uh, end this December. We'll see if we get more wind in North Carolina or not. Uh, but I just wanted to show that for some context. There has been a lot of change that's happened uh, that's going to significantly alter how that works. Most of it came out of a bill that passed last year called House Bill 589. That's really changed the dynamic of how solar gets sited in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and it's really moved it more into the hands of the electric utilities, particularly Duke Energy, uh, which has given them an opportunity to kind of direct traffic a little better. Uh, it has probably slowed the work of the development community because it's making them look in areas in the state that are perhaps a little less rural or a little sub suburban uh, or even ex or about ex urban, I guess, would be the next notch down. The space basically between Charlotte and the Triad. Uh, as we try to move projects more to the west and get more balance between the two utility grids. Uh, but the land's a lot more expensive there, and there's a lot more competing use for that land, and so it's going to be interesting to see if we can achieve those targets. But the other thing, excuse me, the other thing that all this did was it led to a whole lot of stuff that started perpetuating out in the field and in the internet that I started hearing about from county commissioners and planning boards and, and neighboring boards of supervisors in Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, I refer to them as uh, the merchants of doubt, if you're uh, familiar with that book uh, written by uh, Naomi Oreskes up at uh, Harvard. It's an excellent book. Uh, but it basically is uh, a whole process of calling into question facts and trying to create doubt, not necessarily to totally derail something, but at least to slow it down and make it easier to go find an easier place to do things. And we saw a lot of this happen in eastern North Carolina with things that started showing up on the internet. Um, particularly, solar panels are going to pollute the groundwater, uh, electromagnetic fields are going to make my dog explode if I walk too close to the fence line. Uh, there's, you know, all kinds of things. And there, were, there are legitimate concerns about safety that relate to renewables deployment. Most of those concerns are very, very effectively addressed by electric utilities and by the codes and standards that they help to develop. And no project goes in without meeting all of those codes and standards. And so therefore, a lot of this was basically what I would call red hair and stuff. Similar, we saw a lot of aesthetics concerns uh, come up uh, around things like sound and glare. Uh, some of these were more legitimate, but not really that legitimate. And there were methods that were created to deal with them. And so a lot of those also became Kind of red herring issues. Visual impacts, well, there's some people who just don't like how this stuff looks. In eastern North Carolina, where the land is just flat as the floor in this room, you can deal with a lot of that with vegetative buffers if you do it right. But as the projects move further west, we're going to run into problems where this happens. You can put all the vegetative buffering around it that you want, and at a certain distance, you're going to be able to see it. And so uh, there's only so much we can do about that, and it's going to come down to local decisions and local. Uh, communities trying to decide what makes the most sense. So let me skip a little bit, but I just want to talk a little bit about the economic regulatory issues, and some of the property tax issues, um, permitting ordinances that have come up uh, that I think are more legitimate. We talked a little bit about uh, this, that, you know, when solar comes in and replaces farmland, you're really changing the nature of what that land is being used, which means you're changing the nature of the community. You're changing the nature of the jobs that are there. In most cases, solar has larger cash flows in the eastern parts of North Carolina. You know, a lot of this land was leasing for $150 an acre for farmers to use. Solar farmers, solar contractors come in and pay them anywhere from $350 to I've heard crazy rumors of you know upwards of $1,000 an acre. I would characterize this I would say it's crazy rumors, but there are a, a much larger range of, of values that are out there for projects that are being rented for solar. Uh, that has attracted a lot of attention from landowners who feel that property rights give them the right to have that conversation. Uh, tax implications, without going into a lot of discussion here, but uh, it really has changed the tax make of the state. And I'll show you one chart that we're, we're just starting to gather some data on. So a lot of solar land is in what we call the PUV program, the Present Use Value Program, which is the ag program that kind of discounts property taxes on rural land in the state. And when you put solar on that land, it comes out of the PUV program. Well, that does two things. One is PUV discount goes away, and so the basis for taxing that land goes up. The other thing is that now you can put something on the land that's subject to personal property tax side, uh, which is usually tens of millions of dollars of solar equipment. 
So this is five representative counties, and I will say that they were only cherry-picked in the sense that we tried to get geographic dispersity across the state. But you can see uh, just from the bar chart here, this is uh, numbers from annual taxes paid on the property before solar was installed the previous year, and then one year after solar. And the yellow bar there, that's the, the additional and the personal property taxes, and that's with an 80% property tax abatement on the, real, on the personal property tax side. So 80% of the, the value is not taxed at all, but that 20% is a pretty healthy chunk. Now, this is just five counties. This is cumulative numbers of all of the solar that's been installed in those five counties. Do not publish these numbers anywhere. I've still got grad students. The tax databases for all these counties are all over the map. I actually had to send students to the counties to talk to the tax people to try and find the numbers in order to try and fill out the spreadsheets, and we're trying to gather more data on this. But it's a little eye-popping just in terms of what the revenue impacts are to a local county. Um, what we have a lot of less information on and we're still trying to figure out is how we figure out what the impact on neighboring property values is. Uh, there's a lot of people that are very concerned about this if you live next door to a solar farm. There's a lot of data about this on wind farms that basically says it has no impact uh, out west at least. There's a lot of data about this in residential neighborhoods that says that solar on your neighbor's house actually increases the value of your house. Uh, we don't have much in the way of utility solar farms showing up next to your subdivision in Goldsboro, for example. And so we're trying to find more data on that so that we can study <coughs> that question. Um, so all that said, you know, some of the other big things that come up uh, in these discussions are these land use trade-offs. Uh, somebody was asking about decommissioning of projects earlier. That is probably the single biggest topic that has a legitimate conversation that local governments need to have. Uh, and there's a lot to it. Uh, we used to get questions about are we using up all of the farmland in the state? This one used to make me laugh a little bit. Uh, we had to go out and actually, uh, again, NCSEA, the Sustainable Energy Association, I give them a lot of credit for doing the GIS work to go out and map all the projects. As of the end of 2016, so this is a little bit old now, but we had about 9,000 acres of former ag land, which was about 0.2% of North Carolina's 4.75 million acres of total crop land that was supporting. Uh, solar. So I think the phenomenon is solar tends to get located next to power lines. Power lines tend to run next to roads, and so people see a lot of solar panels, but they don't see the back 40 and the back 40 behind that and the back 40 behind that. Uh, and so there was a perception that was not really real. Now this may start to change because of some of those law changes we talked about. We're seeing solar farms getting much, much larger. I was talking to a reporter on my way over here from uh, a Virginia pilot. There's a project that's been proposed up in Pasture Tank, up in uh, an area called the Desert, which is where that uh, large wind farm is as well. And they've got a little over 2,000 acres under control for one large project there. And he was asking if that was the largest project east of the Mississippi. Uh, I told him no, the largest project that I'm aware of is actually now at 6,000 acres under control in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And they're building a half a gigawatt of solar uh, in that one project alone. So, the economics, and this is partially in North Carolina, the changes from House Bill 589 were moving some of the reasons that it was easier to build 30 to 50 acre projects. Uh, we've kind of now moved all of the dynamic to bigger is better, and that's going to have an impact. I think South Carolina is starting to see this as well, and we'll hear some more about that. Uh, but the other things, mostly on the ag side, topsoil grading and erosion in flat areas. You're not doing a lot of grading. It's not a big deal. As we move further west where there's more mountains, we may see more grading and erosion issues that have to be dealt with. That's something locals uh, are used to dealing with with construction projects, but it's definitely something to worry about. Soil compaction, the same thing. It's one of those things that it's clearly a potential issue, but it's easy to resolve if you know what you're doing. Zinc and aluminum are two things that did come up, and I had a long conversation with co-op extension folks at NC State about this. Basically, aluminum, there's a lot of it in the soil already. It's not a big deal, but we do get zinc leaching from the galvanized steel posts and racking systems for solar, and zinc hurts peanuts. And so if you're in a peanut county, you got something to worry about. Basically, none of the other crops in North Carolina care about zinc and aluminum, and so it wasn't an issue. So I always kind of figure out, is it a peanut county or not, before I can talk to them about this, because it's a big deal in those counties. And then, of course, you know, if you're going to put this stuff on the property for an extended period of time, it's going to have some impact on the pH of the soil, how the soil has been maintained, and that sort of thing is going to have to be dealt with. Uh, what we're starting to see is a lot of interest in, um, you know, uh, I, the impervious services. Some people are saying that solar panels are creating runoff problems. That's not really a true thing. It's, it's pretty impervious service in terms of those projects. 
But what we are starting to see is agricultural synergies. Uh, this is a picture of a farm that's got sheep mowing the grass out in uh, the uh, western part of the state. As it gets more humid to the east, it gets a little harder to do that. Uh, the sheep don't like the humidity so much, it's not so great for the wool. But uh, in areas where it makes sense, um, there are you know, companies that are now specializing in having solar sheep to come in and mow the grass in certain areas around the solar farm. They rotate them through and then they sell the meat whole foods as solar farm, solar land, which is great. Uh, if you like that sort of thing, if you like them jobs, I guess. Uh, so there's that conversation. Probably the bigger conversation is around pollinator friendly vegetation. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion that you have to do something to prevent erosion, and so you're going to plant some kind of crop. Uh, you don't want to plant non-native grasses, you want to plant native plants. Well, if you're going to plant native plants, a lot of places around here, there's clovers and things that can be planted that turn also out to be nice pollinator habitats. And so what we're starting to see is the uh, uh, beekeepers can't go inside the fence of the solar farm. There's a whole National Electric Code issue. But they can put the beehives outside of the fence and have a lot of clover growing inside the fence. And it becomes a nice synergy. And I'm actually seeing states that are putting together report cards on how friendly the solar farms are being developed in relation to APA, APA or habitat. And uh, again, I was at the state uh, fairgrounds the other day buying my solar honey from one of the local solar farms. So uh, those synergies are there. I get a little nervous that somebody's going to start to say, oh, look, that solar farm, it really is an ag thing. We shouldn't take it out of the PUV program anymore. If we try to do that, that's going to create a riot, I think, in the Department of Agriculture. So I hope those solar developers get the idea that they're really converting themselves into a true agricultural operation and not in a uh, power operation. But it is nice to find the synergies where they do exist. Uh, and then Brownfields is another site. We're having some conversations in Virginia with folks where they've done mountaintop removal in the western part of the state in very poor areas where there's been a loss of jobs. And again, a nice area where, uh, what else are we going to do with it? Uh, landfills. We've got a, Hazmat site actually right next to the football stadium at NC State with the first large scale solar project in North Carolina and at that point large scale is 77 kilowatts out there. Uh, but it's a large scale uh, for that era uh, project on a uh, otherwise EPA brownfield site. Uh, it's actually a uh, uh, super fund, a mile, or something between super fund and brownfield. It's, it's a bad site, whatever it is. Uh, we couldn't penetrate the ground, we had these ballasted systems, but it's worked out really well. Uh, it's been a way to take that piece of property and turn it into something valuable. Uh, and it's attractive people at the tailgates get to all see solar panels uh, and learn a little bit about solar. So we talked a little bit about decommissioning. Um, you know, this is probably the biggest issue that comes up with the local governments that I deal with. And the biggest issues around this are, okay, so there's some company that owns this, but all these companies, they, they come and they go. The solar industry seems very transient, so how do I know they're going to be around when the project ends 30 years from now? There's a whole range of options on how to deal with this. And what we tell people is pick the range, pick the spot on the range of options that makes you the most comfortable with getting some sort of economic development without basically scaring away everybody, but at the same time giving you some comfort level that you're not going to have a problem. Like a trailer park that gets all the aluminum siding stripped off and it gets abandoned and you wind up with a bunch of skeletons in the, in the field. And so there are a range of things having to have a decommissioning have that decommissioning plan get filed at the deed of registers, uh, or register of deeds every, uh, every five years or so, so that whoever owns the project has to continually update it. Make them include in that the value, the scrap value of the material on site and the removal value of the material on site, so that you know what the delta is and you know how much money it's going to cost. If you want to go another step, you can say force them to have a bond for the delta and the two values. But what we started to see were projects where people were asking for a 30-year removal bond on the front end of a project, you know, to basically say we want, we want the full cost of removal on the front end in a bond in year one. And the developer said, buy there's other counties that I can go work in, and that county lost its economic opportunity. And so trying to find some spot on this spectrum is really what we're looking for. Some counties are more conservative about it, some counties less conservative about it, and it depends on really what is important to that locality. Um, so I'm going to skip through here and just talk a little bit about, you know, you know this idea of harnessing benefits. I kind of see it breaking into uh, two big categories, really, um, or three big categories, excuse me. Uh, one is this job attraction discussion, and I would caution people to be very careful about talking about this. Harrison 
and I have talked about this uh, on other fronts as well. There are jobs associated with this, but they are probably jobs that are being, you know, being created by displacing jobs in some other part of the economy. Uh, the good news is that they may be displacing jobs in a suburban or a rural or a, an urban area where there are plenty of other kinds of jobs that can be created. But the reality is rural solar jobs in particular are pretty transient. They're construction jobs for the most part. The O&M jobs don't have a long lifespan. There are companies that make special efforts to try and build a crew and then rotate them through multiple sites in a rural area. But in the end, they are construction jobs. Uh, there will be some leftover O&M jobs. Some of them are a little bit higher skilled dealing with the electronics, but most of them are guys that are out mowing grass and managing sheep. They're lower skilled jobs, and there's not a lot of them. Uh, the other thing is that you're displacing jobs, especially in some of these rural counties. Uh, you've got some real issues with uh, the land that's being rented out at 350 bucks an acre by the solar guy is displacing some contract farmer that was renting the land for the last six generations from some out-of-state landowner an hour and now he doesn't have a place to farm and when that happens that's a real change for him uh, and especially if it's a farm uh, a county where there's already a lot of farming going on he may not have a lot of other options on where to go and so you may have job losses in the local community of contract farmers that don't have another place to go if the solar farm comes in um, you know there's a lot of shifts in these types of jobs and it differs very the solar is one thing you know, fracking, we had some discussions about North Carolina and, and fracking uh, possibilities. Those are not real compatible with anything else going on at those sites when it happens. Offshore drilling uh, is another discussion that's underway in the state, and that has its own set of conversations about what the implications for jobs are in tourism versus uh, the oil industry. Biogas, um, you know, it's already there. We start capturing biogas and, and uh, cleaning it up and putting it into pipelines and selling it to a university renewable natural gas, that might be a good use of, you know, we're still doing what we were doing in the ag sector and creating some new jobs. Same thing with wind. It's very easy with wind farms to continue farming most of the land between wind turbines. So different energy pieces have different pieces. Uh, infrastructure investment and tax revenue uh, are the other two big ones. You may see some grid improvements. We're going to hear a little bit about that here in just a second. Uh, and allied investments that come with it. And then the tax revenue piece. Um, you know, which we talked about already. So the, those are kind of the big pieces that I see in this. So with that, I want to get our panel to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their piece of the puzzle uh, in this. We've got uh, a great group. Uh, Mi Jin Cha is here. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Occidental College and does a lot of work in the green jobs space. Uh, Mike Kulik uh, and I have known each other for a number of years. He is the uh, president and CEO of the Electric Cooperatives of South Carolina. Kay Jowers is a senior policy associate with the Nicholas Institute over at Duke University. And Robert Sipes, who I saw yesterday in a very lengthy meeting about uh, the uh, investments that they're contemplating on grid modernization. Uh, he's the vice president of the Western Carolina's Modernization Initiative for Duke Energy. So uh, with that, why don't we go just down the table in order if everybody can take five, ten minutes and, and chat and then we'll move to questions. So. Good morning everyone. Uh, thank you to Jonas and Shelly for inviting me here today. I'm very happy to be with you even though it is 20 degrees colder here than in Los Angeles, which is why I'm like shivering. But, um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some overlying concerns that we think about when we think about the transition away from fossil fuels, and then some principles about what we think about uh, for ensuring that investments are done in a way that is best for our workers and communities. Um, so just as a short background, my research nowadays is focused mainly on what we consider just transition, which is, uh, of course, the theme of this conference. Um, really with a focus on how to protect fossil fuel communities and workers in the transition to a lower urban future. Um, and this discussion is particularly important nowadays if you think about it, it's not just a fossil fuel transition that we have to think about, but uh, economy-wide there will be a large transition, um, probably the biggest transition that we've seen, as we go towards more automation, more contributed economies, so the fossil fuel transition is really just part of a larger, more broad economic transition. So it's really important that we make sure that this transition is done in a way that is just. Um, and adding to that, of course, is that previous sector transitions and industrial transitions have been largely unsuccessful. 
So if we think about the lobbying industry in the Pacific Northwest or uh, NAFTA and those big trade agreements, the ability to transition displaced workers into new jobs that pay the same wage and benefits rates has been largely unsuccessful for a variety of reasons that I'm happy to talk about later. But if we think about the impact of the fossil fuels transition, it will be much larger than any previous transition that we've seen. So those challenges are particularly great when we think about the context and the scale of the transition that we, have, we are facing. Um, furthermore, as has been mentioned earlier by Shelley, that this fossil fuel industry is more highly unionized than what we see in the renewable energy sector, um, and they're higher paying. So what we're seeing now is that the solar industry, those jobs are largely not union except for on leafy to and sale projects, but also that the wages in the solar industry are declining um, over time. And more importantly, as also was brought up by Harrison, that the jobs that are being lost are not in the same places that the jobs are being created. So I think he had two really great maps about where coal and gas mining is and then where solar and wind production has, is occurring. And part of that, of course, will never be a one-to-one -one match, right? As he mentioned, that solar and wind are in areas that are not necessarily where coal and gas are. Um, and in fact, as we think about this transition, we want to, uh, our research is about moving away from this one-to-one -one connection. So a direct replacement of fossil fuel jobs with renewable energy jobs for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is the geographic disconnect between where solar jobs are created and wind jobs are created and where fossil fuel jobs are being lost. But there's also a skills disconnect. A coal miner can't necessarily then become a solar installer. Um, but more importantly, we want to move away from being monodependent for especially in rural communities. So part of the, the challenge of this transition is that many of these communities are monodependent upon fossil fuel extraction for both workforce and also for, if you think about the economic benefits that come from fossil fuel extraction. So these communities will also lose much of their tax base when these jobs go away, um, when these mines close. So we want to really think about more diversifying local economies so that are not so dependent on just one industry. Um, so when we think about then moving into kind of what we want to think about, uh, the principles that, we should, that guide us when we talk about investments, um, a big issue is making sure that there's a, a, what we call a seamless pipeline from, if you think about what happened post-2008 recession, where there was this big influx of money into green jobs training, and then those green jobs largely did not materialize. Uh, and that caused a lot of problems, one obviously that there were displaced workers that were not able to find new jobs, but also in terms of the distrust that then became around green jobs and the whole discourse around green jobs. So what we want to do is we want to align the demand for jobs, so job creation, as closely with the supply of jobs, including trained workers, as closely as possible. So we want to make sure that job workers are being trained for jobs that are actually existing and not that jobs will, that will exist in the future. Um, and the final point that I'll make and before moving on to some case study examples is that we want to, as much as possible, and I know this is increasingly challenging, link job standards with investments. So what we don't want is for solutions to climate change to increase existing inequalities. So if you take highly unionized, well-paying fossil fuel jobs and replace them with a bunch of low-paying jobs, right, then the solution to climate change is actually creating economic inequality. And so to that extent, we don't want the solutions to climate change to exacerbate existing inequalities. And the way to do that is to make sure that the jobs that are being created are good jobs that pay family sustaining wages and provide benefits and workplace democracy. Um, and so we think about uh, investing the best way, sorry, when we think about how to make maximize investments in rural communities, especially in this energy transition, I think there are three principles that should guide investment decisions. So the first, as I mentioned earlier, is diversifying the local economy. So again, we want to step away from replacing fossil fuel jobs and only with renewable energy jobs or other energy sector jobs. Um, and you see some of this happening, for instance, the Obama Power Plus initiative, uh, the investments that they made in Appalachia were in uh, community, community college training, technical college training, and healthcare training. So when we think about economically where our economy is going, healthcare will be probably one of the biggest job uh, creators in the future. So being, ensuring that these displaced workers and displaced communities are being trained for jobs that will exist in the future. And then diversifying so that these communities are not monodependent upon one uh, sector. And we see this also in an area in Germany called the Ruhr region. Um, and as I mentioned previously, there are not that many successful sectoral uh, transitions from declining industries into new industries. Um, but the Ruhr region is one example that we kind of look to for guiding principles. Um, one, because it's a regional transformation. 
So the brewer industry was heavily dependent on coal and also on steel production. And had, over the last 50 years has transitioned away from that. Um, and then this year was the last year that they actually uh, subsidized a coal mine. So one, it's the regional transformation, whereas if we think about other examples, they are more about a plant by plant basis. Um, and of course, there are many differences between Germany and, and the US. Uh, most importantly is that they have a very strong social safety net. So for instance, there will be economic distress when their workers are displaced, but they have a very strong wage replacement and benefit replacement system. Um, but it, it also took 50 years, and you don't have 50 years. <laughs> but when, when we look at the lessons that they've really learned, is that they really diversified that regional economy. So it moved away from being dependent on steel and coal production to uh, art centers, to uh, hubs for technology, for new tech coming up. There is some solar as well. So you see, and there um, is a technical and training schools. So they have diversified the regional economy away from being dependent on just one industry. Um, the second principle is ensuring that there is a dedicated funding stream. And this is particularly important because if you think about the transition to the Trade Adjustment Act, uh, which helped, was trying to help workers that were displaced by globalization, that depended on congressional um, reauthorization. So the funding levels were really mixed, which meant that there wasn't sustained investments in training workers and creating new jobs and then placing those workers in those jobs. So dedicated funding streams are very important also for long-term planning. Um, and we can think about it in terms of something akin to like the Superfund program where they've actually uh, functioned well. The idea that people who are causing these harms should pay for the remediation and the cost of moving away from these harms. Um, and there are a couple of other examples that I think are good uh, examples of dedicated funding streams. Um, one is, well actually it's not <laughs> successful, but it is a very good idea which is the carbon tax in Washington State that unfortunately did not pass. But it had a very remarkable uh, way of uh, investing in both declining communities and also in the economy of the future. So the revenue that came from the carbon tax was uh, split into three different buckets, we could say. But also what was important was that the people that were in charge of deciding where that money would go <coughs> were hard and impacted communities. So the boards that made up, uh, the community that would make up who decided who got this funding was made up of people who were uh, former fossil fuel workers or from EJ communities or from other disadvantaged tribal communities. So it's very important also that there, if we think back to um, Shelley's presentation on participatory democracy and participatory justice, like ensuring that people who are being impacted by this transition have a say in the future is very important um, from, a, from a moral and justice standpoint. Um, there's also the example of Diablo Canyon, which is a nuclear power plant in California that is being decommissioned. Uh, and this example, I think, is very interesting because they actually have a proactive transition plan. Um, and what, in short, labor unions, uh, the environmentalists, and the anti-nuclear groups, and the, the utility got together to create a proactive plan for what would happen after the, plan, uh, the nuclear power plant went offline. Um, and. Uh, the important part of Diablo Canyon is that they also included a part for community transition, understanding that their tax base would be severely impacted once the nuclear power plant closed. And I think this is a great example of how a diverse coalition is really, can really get you a much stronger uh, bargaining position. Um, and also, as if we tie back to our need to diversify uh, global economies, a large portion of the worker transition package was helping to take the plant offline. So there will be a lot of work that is created that is necessary, that is, uh, there's, really, there's a lot of demand for remediating these more fossil fuel sites. Um, and I think that we should think of that as a job creator in addition to the other uh, sectors that I have mentioned. And finally, uh, and, uh, my final point is the role of the public sector. Um, and I know that the public sector is a uh, constant attack, but we really see um, uh, the public sector as a place where a lot of these things can take hold and then uh, be a guiding an example for the private sector. Uh, so for instance, I worked on a project uh, called Labor Living on Climate, which is a project, a three-year project in New York State that started the labor movement and uh, was a proactive climate agenda from the labor movement perspective. And the reason why we started the labor movement was again to ensure that workers that would be impacted by the transition away from fossil fuels were a part of the solution to what would happen when, as we transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and as part of this initiative, we released a, a, a report and a series of policy recommendations 
that were really grounded in the public sector, also uh, with the idea that renewable energy should be a public good and not be something that only can be for people who could afford it. Um, and so many of our initiatives here just actually build on what the state was already doing and just increase them. So again, if you think about implementation, it's much easier to start with a program that exists and expand it for investment than to try to create new programs. So for instance, energy efficiency standards in public buildings, you could just double that standard. Um, we talked a lot about installing solar on schools, and the reason why we chose schools was that schools are usually a healthcare community. So if you want to build organizing will around solar, having a really high profile project like a, school, like a school, and then thinking of all the benefits that come to the children in the school for having solar energy is a great way to build support for solar and also to build support for our public projects. And of course, when you have public projects, it's much easier to put in job standards and wage standards than in the private sector. Um, so as a result of our report, there was an organizing campaign that started, and uh, last year, Governor Cuomo announced an initiative called the Clean, Clean, sorry, the Clean, it's such a terrible uh, word, Clean Climate Careers Initiative. Clean Climate, no, Climate, it's something about climate and energy. <laughs> uh, and as part of it, uh, he, uh, committed to investing $1.5 million to create 40,000 climate jobs. And we really want to think about linking again them together so it's not just job creation, but ensuring that there are good jobs that are being created. So we want to create good family sustaining jobs. And so this initiative will uh, take some of our recommendations such as doubling energy efficiency and solar production and starting in the public sector. So again, when we think about how investments in the new energy economy, I think the three things that are important to think about is diversifying uh, energy economic development uh, and dedicated funding streams and ensuring that as much of it is done in the public sector as possible. Thank you. So we have any questions for you before we go on to Mike talk a little bit about what's going on in the co-ops while my laptop decides to come back on. There was an interesting article in yesterday's New York Times that talked about the emerging role of mega cities. It talked about New York, Washington, D.C., London, Paris, Berlin, places like that. And in the future, it was going to be impossible for any other city of any size to compete with these mega cities for the attraction of companies like Amazon with their HQ2. And it was going to see there was going to be this magnet of these me of these mega cities that were going to pull out America's big best students and have them move to mega cities. I've already seen that on the house. I've got a daughter who lives in Seattle, Washington, works for Amazon and getting her degree at MBA at the University of Washington, even though she's born and bred in South Carolina, a game cop. The South and rural South has been battling that for a long time. We're not the only ones. China, Eastern China versus Western China, where the jobs are, you had a complete relationship of the elderly being remain in Western China and the younger folks moving to the coast of China. And what's been left behind are these group of impoverished elderly people that where there's no sufficient support network. I see that in my own electric co-ops and what we're doing more bad than that. A couple of themes I want to bring you today is local is good, small is good, we need innovation to solve all the challenges that we've got. I don't believe innovation needs to be a silver bullet. I'm a victim of a silver bullet right now in South Carolina, where they decided that we were going to have a massive two nuclear units in Jenkinsville. And right now it's a $9 billion hole in the ground that's not going to be finished. And that we're battling to get our people's money back. When I say my people, our people, one and a half million South Carolinians give their electricity from electric co-op. We're in all 46 counties. We serve some amazing places. Two of the most economically depressed areas in the state of South Carolina could not get an electric carrier to come to them. They flipped a coin, and the loser had to get the territory. There were half a dozen African-American farm families on one of the places. Nobody moved on the other one. The names of those two places, Hilton Head and Kiowa. And think about how times change. Think about how we need to be careful that we don't enslave anybody to the wrong choices as it relates to the economics of nuclear. But also, we don't take territory and we leave it so damaged it can't become a Kiowa or a Hilton Head. 
And that's where we are in North Carolina with co-ops, in South Carolina with co-ops, in all those 47 states we have co-ops. Local's good, innovation's good, but give us space not to be governed. We're not governed, we're probably not we're, we're, we're governed by those people we serve. Uh, I want to confirm a couple of concerns. Uh, everything I've heard mentioned today about the rural South, I agree with, and that we need to be concerned about. I also want to go back to, there's no silver, silver bullet solution. It really just lends itself to this irrational exuberance of whether it be nuclear or solar or clean coal dot with. You know, all those things are just bumper stickers. We gotta get beyond bumper stickers. These are real people that are being impacted. Broadband and the whys and the why nots, I'm all for it, but it doesn't fit every co-op. It fits lots of co-ops. I've got co-ops doing it for the right reason. Not just they want to compete with Verizon for broadband, they need to build it out in their trunk of substations to communicate with their local consumer members so they can make smart decisions on demand-side management. Ultimately, they may have a plug-in electric vehicle that you want to send a signal to. We'd like to buy electricity back from you. You bought it last night when it's cheap, we need it back today. And by doing that, we can avoid building another gas fire turbine. Those are all decisions that rural America deserves to participate in. It shouldn't be reserved to mega cities or Seattle. We talked earlier a little bit about persistent poverty counties. There are a lot of those in South Carolina. 12 of them. They fall along I-95 with the quarter of shame. Those 12 counties. What you see there with those dots is South Carolina's energy efficiency retrofit program piloted and pioneered by co-ops in South Carolina, where we do the thing I'm most proud of in my career. We go into a home and we do a building performance institute audit. It tells us what, how the home can be improved. We tell the homeowner if he'll do these things, we will pay the contractor to do the work on energy efficiency, so long as we can do a BPI audit on the back side and make sure it's going to perform and you're going to save enough money that theoretically, and we've been proven, that at least one third of the savings stays in your pocket month one. We find ourselves doing the envelope, HVAC. These are low tech things, but the thing I like about this, these are where the jobs are located. And these are people that can do jobs and be trained to do it. We had to battle to get this out of Congress because it didn't meet the standard of being neat. It wasn't mega city neat. It wasn't something that looked like it was going to change a single technology, but it makes common sense. It makes common sense. And this is the elderly, the support. How many folks here live in a manufacturer home raise your hand? I don't think so. One out of four of my folks live in a manufacturer. And those homes aren't necessarily energy inefficient, but after time they become energy inefficient. It's pretty easy how you can go in there and fix those and make the bill go down. And that's odd for an electric utility to do. If you, want, you want the bill to go down. The other thing is we need to change our rate structures. We've had this evolution of rate structures from volumetric, we'll sell as much as we can to recover our costs to one where we started talking about our basic facilities charges needs to cover our cost. And there's a separate evolution called three-part rates. And I won't spend any time on it, but I will just go to this last slide where 50% of one of my co-ops costs each month to their members is basically related to plant equipment that sits there to be used. It may not be being used. Capital's been invested in it if it's needed. And somebody has to pay for it. Well, how do you measure who pays for it? You take that member, that consumer, that contributes the most to peak demand within the month. Who is the most energy efficient person? Who's the air conditioning hall? Who's running their, who's running their dryer at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in the summer? All those things. That person is pushing to peak up. You, have, you should charge that person for that choice. You should help the people that can't avoid that choice, avoid that choice through energy efficiency retrofits, like we talked about. But what we find is when we kind of correlate member consumer interest with our interests as co-ops, it starts going down. 
and you can start avoiding building new plant equipment. And I think that's the game. We've got another generation in this country who will use it wisely, who will use demand side management. We may need to tinker with it, but we, we can get there together. I'm delighted to be here with you today. It's an interesting topic we're talking about. So I would argue 
<clears throat> that as it relates to how this energy transformation that we're talking about, how that relates to rural communities, I'm very bullish on that. I think, at least from uh, the grid standpoint and the electric utility perspective, I think it's going to be a really good thing for our rural communities. So let me tell you a little bit about why I say that. Think about the traditional uh, utility model of central station generation, power flowing through transmission lines to distribution lines, and then so on down the line till you get to the end of the line, right? Who's typically at the end of the line? Rural communities, right? Now, um, at Duke Energy, we are committed to serve all customers without prejudice. And so we do our absolute best to serve all customers to the same levels of performance with the same levels of investment uh, in those facilities to serve them. By its nature, we are much more, our investments are much more concentrated in urban and suburban areas, much less concentrated in rural areas. And so as a result, typically rural areas receive uh, lower or poor levels of reliability uh, and, uh, and also uh, very often extended power outages because of where they live and how they're connected to the grid. Well, that's the traditional model, if you will, for how we serve customers. Now, think about what the new model looks like. You've got a lot more distributed energy resources. You've got a lot more need for network connectivity as well as remote operation of the grid. That rising tide raises all ships, and in fact, it enables us to concentrate more investment in some of these rural areas that haven't, that where we really haven't been able to. Because one of the things that this transformation enables is an ability for us to stack the benefits that we get from some of these improvements. So the way we look at it is we've got another tool in our toolbox, right? So let me give you an example of that. Uh, in Western North Carolina, there's a small town by the name of Hot Springs. Hot Springs is at the end of a 10-mile line that runs through some of the most rugged terrain in Western North Carolina, served by one line. When that line goes out, Hot Springs is out, and they're out for a long time. Now, that line doesn't go out that often, but when it does go out, it is, it is hugely impactful to that town. Because Hot Springs, which was once a sleepy little town with a hardware store and a, and a small grocery store, has now become a huge tourist area. So an outage that wipes out business for an entire Saturday during peak tourist season adds up to huge expense. Well, what we've done is we've developed a solution for hot springs where we can combine storage with uh, enabling them to, or having that storage available to provide backup service, also connected to uh, solar uh, panels, so that when power goes out to hot springs now, we can get them back on much more quickly and uh, while well, we can go about the, the process of repairing the lines. And so in the past, we wouldn't have had that tool to use. And the cost to construct a back feed into hot springs would have been hugely expensive and cost prohibitive. But now we have that tool that we can use put the uh, businesses in hot springs uh, back online. So if I was to kind of summarize the sorts of investments that we're talking about here, uh, investments in distributed energy resources like solar and storage, investments in grid improvement uh, that enable the grid to take advantage of a lot of these new and emerging technologies uh, and things like that. Uh, and then kind of switching gears and putting uh, the natural gas hat on, uh, in
investment in uh, gas pipeline and compressing stations uh, for natural gas. And the benefits uh, are numerous. Reliability and resiliency. You know, as I said in the case of the hot springs example, uh, we have a lot more tools in our toolbox now to enable that. <clears throat> Distributed energy resource integration, uh, ability to accommodate more of the distributed energy resources on our system. Efficiency tools that give customers more, uh, greater ability to understand how they're using electricity and how they can use it more efficiently. Economic development, you know, one of the things that I think has uh, suppressed uh, the desire of businesses to locate in some of these areas has been poor reliability and things like that. Well, if we are starting to have some additional tools to address that, then that takes away a barrier uh, to businesses to locate some of these areas. <coughs> and then finally, as Steve mentioned in his comments, tax base. Uh, a lot of these investments will significantly add to the tax base of these communities uh, and as a result uh, enable uh, achieving a lot of the benefits that come with that. So that's kind of our view of how our grid improvements can be leveraged to the benefit of our small communities. So I'll turn it back over to you, Steve. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see how much churn there is going on and all the new opportunities that are rolling downhill be it in uh, you know the large scale utility investments in grid modernization the things that are making closer to the individuals that are going on in the co-ops and trying to make just individual uh, situations better in homes through energy improvement program and things of that nature uh, some of the solar stuff that I rambled on too long about at the front end of the talk you know there's just a lot going on in these communities the problem is that a lot of these communities have heard stories like this before. And you know, one of the things that you know tends to be a problem is that while we hear a lot of benefits uh, that are potentially coming from these types of investments, they don't always materialize, they're not always at nine, what was it, nine billion, how many billion dollar hole was that? Nine billion dollar hole in the ground. But there there are issues there. Um, our last speaker, uh, Kay Jower, she's, she's been working on some innovative uh, mechanisms to help local communities and local nonprofit organizations and potentially local governments work together with the developers, the utilities, and others to try and find ways to make sure that we have better ways to really capture those types of benefits. And so I'll let her talk a little bit about that. Good morning, or I guess we're after now. So good afternoon, and I realize that I am between you and lunch, which is never where you want to be as a speaker. So I will try to be quick, um, so we can have some questions before everybody gets food. So um, just by way of uh, background, I'm not an energy person per se. I'm an environmental lawyer and a social scientist by training. So my area of expertise, is, as Steve was saying, is in working on environmental inequality, environmental equity, and environmental ethics issues. So my colleagues tend to bring me in when there are issues of environmental inequality, which means I get to work on everything from water to air to uh, energy to sometimes even endangered species. Um, so, and I'm a little bit of a generalist in that way. So the tool I'm gonna to talk to you about is community benefits agreements. And it's something that I've mostly been using in urban communities in rural communities and hasn't in the past been used in rural communities. So community benefits agreements are essentially a blend of land use law and community development law and policy. And it provides a means to address some of those things that Shelley was talking about earlier around procedural and participatory justice and distributive justice. It's a legally binding contract or set of contracts that set forth a range of community benefits that will accompany a development project. And it usually results from some kind of substantial community uh, negotiation between the developer 
possibly the local government and uh, different community groups. So it's a contract that can be between two private parties, or it can, in some areas, be the local government engaging in the contract as well. That tends to work better in states that are local rural states. North Carolina is a Dillon's rural state where we, our municipalities and counties derive all their ability to exist from statute. And so um, that doesn't work so well when you're uh, having a community benefit agreement in a Dillon's rural state. But many of the provisions can address some of the things that the other panelists have talked about. They can address social justice concerns um, that our earlier panelist, Marilyn Marshall Robinson, was talking about with regard to the isms, and um, can also address jobs, uh, living wage requirements, or it could be some kind of first sourcing agreement that you're going to hire locals and train them. Um, it could, does, that those jobs that are agreed to don't have to be, as Nietzsche was mentioning, they don't have to be related to energy um, investment. It could be some other kind of job training, like the healthcare industry or arts or teachers and education training. Um, it can address affordable housing. So uh, a lot of times if there is a, a developer coming into an urban area, this is what we use to make sure a set aside is in place for affordable housing units. Um, and it could also just be for funding for community services and programs. So sometimes uh, communities negotiate to get a community center or a community, uh, a job training center, uh, for example, is one of the ones that was used in Detroit that's used as a, a big example. Probably won't have time to get into some of the case studies because I wanted to get to sort of enforcement and implementation and the all the yeah buts that I anticipate coming. Um, so the yeah buts, yeah but what's in it for me if I'm a local government? If I'm a local government, the incentives are that you get a lot of the conflict that comes out in your public hearings negotiated and worked out in advance. It streamlines the decision-making process. If I'm a private entity, that's the, kind of the same thing. You get a lot of those potential conflicts and getting your permit approvals uh, negotiated and worked through in advance of a, a permitting approval process. If you're a community, you get a voice and a stake in the process in a way that often when community members are placed into a political process in front of a local government, they don't have the same power, the same negotiating power that the private entities and other uh, decision makers are, uh, have. So how do they get enforced? It's a private contract. It's enforceable in a court of law, theoretically. If you are a community group, however, you might not have the resources to enforce those kinds of contracts. So a lot of these CBAs will actually have provisions that part of it is a set aside, a fund set aside, so that there can be an enforcement and implementation. Um, if you look at the case law on community benefits agreements, you're not going to find much. They haven't really been litigated. I think that's because of the two other enforcement mechanisms that tend to be pretty effective. One is that you can incorporate community benefits agreements into your land use approvals, into your government approvals. You have to have enabling legislation that has development approvals that get incorporated into permits. Luckily in North Carolina, we do have that. CBAs haven't been used and incorporated that much into development plans yet because that change occurred in uh, around about the time we hit the recession and a lot of development just wasn't happening. And um, hopefully we'll see as people recognize that there is this ability to incorporate these kinds of provisions into de development plans in North Carolina that they use them more often. Something that we're doing in, a, in an urban community in East Durham. Um, other ways that these get enforced is just by collective action and public accountability. If this is a public decision and the communities have negotiated an agreement and some private actor or local government has made a commitment, there's also just the ability to enforce it by a way of calling attention to the fact that they aren't fulfilling their obligations. And so that actually has been quite effective in getting actors who, private actors who have agreed to these kinds of uh, benefits agreements in other states 
to follow through even when they appear to be derelict in their duties. It's just realizing that there is a court of public opinion that can be called on and collective action can be used to um, hold them accountable to the things that they've committed to. Um, so for rural and energy projects, I think these are a, a, a potential tool that communities could use, uh, that communities, that utilities, that local governments can use, and that there are benefits to using, and I look forward to having a conversation about um, how they might be applicable for your questions or conversations this afternoon. Thanks. Okay, you're going to speak more about these mechanisms tomorrow as well, right, as part of the workshop, so folks will be here tomorrow. Um, it sounds fascinating, and uh, I just have one quick question on that front. I'm trying to envision ways that something like that can simplify some of these decommissioning conversations uh, around uh, renewable energy projects at the, uh, at the local level. Can these be entered into between, say, a landowner and a developer? and have that be required through local ordinance that they have some sort of agreement to deal with decommissioning through a CBA, uh, if I'm getting the acronym right. Uh, could something like that work? Is this on? Yep. Um, it, it could. They are typically community organizations looking for community benefits. So you would likely see this occurring more if there was a third party to that agreement that also had some stake in the decommissioning process and um, wanted to ensure that there was follow through uh, on as things um, came to a, a, a conclusion there. So it, that would just be, I think, a private contract between the landowner and the developer. But required by the locale. The, so um, I apologize, I didn't go into this. So the local government isn't necessarily a party to the agreements. However, you know, in some states there are ordinances that actually enable and require communities and, uh, and private actors and developers to go through this negotiated process. We don't have anything like that in North Carolina and, uh, and don't, I don't foresee any uh, cities and counties that, uh, trying that. I'm, I'm not sure it's enabled by our statutes. Um, and it, however, is usually the local government saying it's more of a political, we'd like you to work this out with the community before you come to us, is how I have seen it used in urban areas, at least, where the city or the county county board or the city council says, you know, we, we know this is going to be uh, problematic in this particular community and we want you to sit down in advance and uh, have uh, conversations with these particular parties. So it's less of a formal role for the local government and more of a political Okay, all right. So we have questions from the audience? Steve, can I make one comment? Yeah, absolutely. Community benefit funds seem to be an expensive workaround for when you don't have an electric cooperative. <laughs> because when you have an electric property, there's an absolute, uh, the, the comp, there's a consolidation of identity between member, shareholder, ratepayer, the community who's benefiting from choices made by an empowered board. We created Operation Roundup in South Carolina 28 years ago where they make choices to round up their bill. And those dollars, when they round up, then go back to the community to fund things that are tantamount to being a community benefit fund. I do want to share, I have some concern about community benefit funds coming in as a concept when there's a consideration, well, we're not really paying for it. At least in the idea of an electric cooperative, there's no shareholder that resides in New York City that's taking a haircut on return on a dividend. It's that local community, those local co-ops that will be paying for their own community benefit fund. And that's why I really like the co-op co co business model. It's all right there, it's all on the table at one time, but it's all about the community. So I saw one question back here. 
My question's for Robert. So I'm from Western North Carolina. I remember what you spoke about briefly, very vividly. Um, and my question is, um, you mentioned that you actually stopped the process and you heard the concerns of community members for that proposed pipeline and gas plant. What's different about that pipeline and the proposed Atlantic Coast pipeline in the eastern part of the state? Yeah, so the uh, uh, ACP is a gas transmission pipeline which carries bulk gas from the fields where it's extracted to various geographic areas where uh, it's consumed. In the case of the pipeline that <coughs> is serving Asheville, that's more of a uh, large distribution pipeline that originates in Kings Mountain and just extends up to Asheville. So it's a lower level pipeline that is really uh, intended to move gas within the state as opposed to from other areas outside of the state. Roberts, I understand that most of the ACP capacity was spoken for before construction started just to basically go down and replace some of the existing coal facilities with gas capacity. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I'd have to ask someone who's closer to it than me. Another question? My question is for Mr. Cowart. Um, your presentation talked a lot about uh, demand and correlating demand with pricing, and, and I get that. I appreciate that. However, most consumer advocates um, pose uh, imposing a demand charge on residential customers. Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of how, particularly the residential realm, we can better correlate that without imposing a demand charge that is frequently confusing and difficult for residential customers. Yes, yes, absolutely. Is problem? There, there's Actually, right before you do that, thing, Chris, you probably ought to identify yourself. I'm Chris Ayers. I'm the director of the public staff here in North Carolina, so I'm the consumer advocate for North Carolina. <laughs> and I would share with you, there's at least 30 minutes of presentation I didn't give, and probably not even really qualified with about my limitations I have a literature career and a law degree. Uh, I would tell you, I'd like to talk to you at the other lunch. There's a lot of historical data the co-op had that imposed that. They spent a lot of time educating their members about how to avoid it. They were very scientific about their approach. They took their time as they did it. They came from within and wasn't imposed. And I think that's one of the challenges with regulation of traditional IOUs is how do you get that balance? I, I talked to you over lunch later. Right. Take a few more questions until the right. chair starts to Just a follow up on that point as well. So uh, what are the, in your opinion, some of the merits of demand charge versus something like critical pre-pricing or, or a direct uh, time of use pricing. What I was suggesting is you divide the bill into three parts, however you think. You've got a basic facilities cost of just being a member or a rate payer, and there are things that don't really change and not really related to generation. They're related to the T and the D primarily, transmission distribution. But on the generation side, there's two components that we don't often talk about and are very complicated to talk about. And I've appeared before legislative committees in the last several months where they struggle to understand low factor. But when you divide it out with the difference between uh, that demand and that fuel, and you lead people to understand just because we're not burning fuel, that doesn't mean that somebody's not still got to pay for the capital invested, that $9 billion. Somebody's going to pay for it. And the way most utilities charge for that capital, that investment, is by looking how much you contribute to peak. And a residence is always contributing to peak like this. An industry is going to contribute like that. A lot of commercial is more like this. So who pays for peak? The elderly, the poor, those folks that have unimproved housing stock. Who's not paying for the peak? Generally industry. People that are, have well insulated housing stock. Young folks that live in the kind of housing we're right on us right now, this well insulated, they're not paying for it. It's the people in rural America that are paying for that in general. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Robert. Um, as you know, earlier this week, um, the North Carolina State University Energy Storage Study came out, and so I was listening um, intently on your talking about the Hot Springs Project. I wanted to know if you could tell me if that was a cost-effective solution 
um, based on 2018 prices? And if not, why not? Yes, it is. Um, we did an extensive cost-benefit analysis for that project and included quite a few different uh, value streams that contribute to the, to the benefit of that project. One of the, one of the benefits that we did uh, include that we uh, typically don't include for a traditional type of project is the value of the reliability to some degree. Um, but yes, there has been a cost effectiveness that we've done for that project. And would you say that's an anomaly? Would that project have been an anomaly for that? Oh, an anomaly in what sense? In other words, it was cost effective, but that's an anomaly in your opinion? Or that's more uh, just a business as usual thing? Um, well, it's the first project of that type that we have uh, taken to this point. So I don't know that I can single it out as an anomaly. Okay. Um, That's fair. Yeah. But, but including reliability in that calculation, that part is a little bit of an anomaly. Yes. Okay. But it was possible. Yes. Okay. So, uh, other questions? I know lunch is just about set. I mean, Jeanette, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Um, you know, we talked a lot about all of these jobs and, you know, a lot of the investment, particularly, um, you know, in all of these fields, there's kind of a real break between kind of the high-tech, high-trained jobs and the lower-tech, lower-trained jobs. And, you know, there's obviously a big scale separation in those. Um, you know, how do we get more of the benefit of this transition into communities where there are, you know, aren't as many um, you know, opportunities for those high paying jobs, which we find in the, the urban areas. I mean, like the, the Research Triangle Park, for example, is one of the largest hubs of clean tech, smart grid companies in the, in the world. Uh, and I, as someone who's trying to hire engineers right now, it sucks um, you know, because it's hard to compete. But um, there's got to be ways that we can make this balance the equation a little better. Do you have thoughts on that? That's such a good question, and I think it's not just going to be in the energy sector, but you can't be why, as we see a transition, even right from the way to use bifurcation of very high skill, high paying jobs, and very low skill, low wage jobs. Um, and I think the solutions that are kind of what we think about for economic security generally, like a higher minimum wage would help, um, regardless of job and the skill level you had, um, benefits packages. Um, and I think, again, if you think about, if we kind of reverse our model of development from an income institution and have that be the full economic development, I think the more you diversify your economy, uh, the more you have opportunities for varying levels of skill level of jobs. One last question from the audience? No? Oh, one last question. Oh, okay. So, um, the piggyback thing on that, the, um, um, piggybacking on that, I've thought a lot about kind of the apprenticeship models that have gotten moved away from and that maybe things like cybersecurity provide an opportunity for because those are more kind of certification based than like traditional four year degrees. So you don't have to put forth as much time to get somewhere else. And also like skills diversification. So as opposed to specialization. Because I think, like, to your point, why you might have difficulty in finding engineers is because that engineers have um, lots of opportunities generally to move into different spaces <coughs> and do kind of different jobs, and that that's kind of the nature of, of that part. So is that, how is that playing into kind of the question? Absolutely. I think we've really de-invested, divested, sorry. <laughs> Divested from something like trade schools, and we have this model where we push everybody to a four year institution. And I'm not sure that's the right model for at all. I mean, we don't want a society that's only doctors and lawyers and no people that actually make the world go around. Um, so I think that as we rethink how our economy will look in the next 20 years, reinvesting in trade schools, trying to understand where people will have demand, I think healthcare will be a huge industry, and there are very levels of skills and jobs there. Um, but actually, I agree with the apprenticeship model is a very good model for not only ensuring a, job, a pipeline to a job, but also continual training opportunities, for sure. Yeah, there's actually a, a strong effort in the work of uh, line worker training in this space right now. Uh, in North Carolina, Duke Energy, the North Carolina co-ops and communities are all really pushing hard in the 
there's a real shortage of line workers, and apparently the few that we've got are all in their 60s and they're running out of time to train in the next generation. They are great paying jobs for somebody with a two-year degree or less in some cases, and we just can't find the bodies to fill them. And strangely enough, we need a lot of the same skill sets for the build out of the distributed energy resource economy. So there's a lot of fit there. So that's a great point. Well, thank you all so much for your attention. Uh, Joe, I apologize about rambling so much at the front end, uh, but did the best I could. Uh, thank you to the panel. I think we had a great group here. And uh, unless you have anything else, I'll turn it over to you. Sorry about the panel.